a warm welcome, a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening from wherever you are uh, joining us. A great pleasure to welcome you on this third and final day of our 19th World Wind Energy Conference to this session, which um, seems to tackle a topic that sounds not so exciting, uh, wind farm approval processes. But as you will understand, latest after this session, I hope it is a key topic if we want to proceed and achieve the climate targets and the renewable energy targets in all countries around the world. Um, a very important uh, uh, topic as it kind of determines the speed in which we can uh, implement renewable energy, in particular wind farms. So it's my great pleasure. We have a great panel of speakers here with us. Um, we have, uh, if I may just briefly introduce Gadi Hareli from the Israel Wind Energy Association. Gadi, um, I can still say, I think, a good morning to you. We have uh, John Tichin, I think he will join us from Australia. Um, if he's with us here yet, uh, Webcon, please make him a presenter as well. Um, we have here Ashish Swarup from Spring, an, an Indian company, who speak about the situation in India. And we have Davide Astiazo Garcia from the Italian Wind Energy Association, ANEF, who will speak about the wind power permitting uh, situation uh, with a specific focus on Italy. That all will be followed by a discussion and, of course, questions and answers. Um, you in the audience, you can put your questions and we will see them here and can refer to them. So without uh, then further ado, I'm uh, then happy to welcome our first speaker again, uh, Gadi Hareli, who is the CEO of the Israel Wind Energy Association. My great pleasure to welcome you, Gadi. Gadi, you also uh, have been on the board of the World Wind Energy Association now for many years. Um, and uh, you personally hosted also one of the previous World Wind Energy Conferences when we could still meet uh, in person. It was in 2015 when we held this World Wind Energy Conference in Jerusalem. Now it's my pleasure to invite you to give a general introduction into the topic and of course also refer to the status in Israel, maybe also explaining what happened since the time when we met uh, in your home country. Gadi, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you, uh, Stefan, for the kind introduction. Um, let me share my presentation here. Okay. Is it visible? Yeah. Good. Okay, so... Um, Briefly about myself, I'm currently working with the Ministry of, uh, of Energy uh, uh, as an advisor uh, where I'm uh, escorting multiple companies, tens of companies uh, uh, and research activities in universities. Uh, as Stefan mentioned, chairing the Israeli Wind Energy Association and actively trying to be actively involved uh, with the activity of the World Wind Energy Association. Uh, chairing the uh, World Wind Energy Conference of 2015. Uh, background of engineering and my passion really is into technology, so uh, I have been and still am highly involved in development of technologies, many of them wind energy, but did also what was the CEO of a hydroelectric company and solar activities. Uh, some of the activities got awards like the Eureka, uh, Eureka and Eurogea labels for R&D uh, initiatives. Uh, I also participated uh, the local Israeli uh, technical committee uh, of, uh, for wind regulations here in Israel. And uh, as, as part of that activity, I also uh, participated the IACTC 88 the technical committee uh, for wind energy. Uh, represented Israel for the IEA wind uh, activities um, and uh, also took a significant part in the uh, local uh, regulatory framework setting up uh, here in Israel, uh, which took a long time and as a, as a technical person, 
seeing uh, the amount of uh, politics involved was uh, amazing. Following that, I also participated in many discussions within the parliament. Uh, I'm also involved in uh, wind farm development, where I assist uh, developers uh, in their uh, setting up and developing the wind farms. I also led some activities in uh, hydropower, smart water network consortium uh, here in Israel. Uh, I have two companies that I'm currently uh, running and uh, also involved in the, drive, the development of drivetrain for electric vehicles. Uh, and some other activities as well. I stopped here, just a brief introduction. Um, and the basics is that I'm really passionate uh, about uh, the transition to renewables. Uh, and uh, this is where I'm coming from. Now, from, uh, from what we, uh, what I currently experience and uh, uh, is that uh, that the reality is such that uh, we start with the government setting up a framework of uh, defining targets. And then when you go inside, the, you see that different ministries have different interests and the, the, the game rules which are set are practically a compromise between the different uh, uh, involved parties, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Environment, uh, Environmental Protection, Land Authorities, Ministry of Economy, uh, regarding tariffs uh, and so on, uh, Aviation Authorities, Agriculture, Green Movements and Greener Movements. Uh, it's so strange to see the, the green, green Movements fighting against wind energy and so forth. And at the, the end of the of the day, we come up with a set of, uh, of rules, mostly uh, also uh, incorporating some uh, international regulations no, known from other locations. At least this is uh, my experience here. Uh, and then uh, the developers start uh, working according to the game rules, uh, and we see that the developers fighting between each other uh, and obviously there is uh, there is a part of the citizens i've just been attending a hearing uh, last week in which you see even the citizens themselves those who get uh, uh, benefits from the wind farm that is uh, under development uh, practically uh, arguing, fighting with uh, their neighbors, and you see that local communities start splitting uh, due to the uh, uh, setting up of, uh, of the uh, wind farm in the vicinity of their uh, habitats. And uh, the government who sets the rules, then uh, the local authorities have to use those uh, game rules to uh, intermediate between the developers, the citizens, and uh, finally uh, decide uh, where to go next. Um, now, I'm not sure about other countries, I assume it's pretty much the same, but at the end of the day, uh, when you have to come up to uh, with a decision, you take a decision and it can potentially become a mistake that uh, we all pay for at the end of the day, uh, having uh, pretty severe consequences. Uh, and I decided to choose some of them, which I personally am facing uh, uh, in the wind energy, energy sector. So here, for example, we look at, uh, at the fact that we have to consider noise, flicker, safety, if it's ice throw or uh, other uh, safety issues. And uh, many countries, uh, such as Israel, for example, we, uh, the, 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 the finalized decision was uh, a certain zoning distance uh at which wind turbines should not not be located now israel is very highly populated so the chances of 
finding a location spot which is at least say one kilometer or two kilometers from from dwelling is very slim and even if uh, even if the the person who lives in that dwelling doesn't mind about having the wind farm it's simply uh, not ah uh, sorry let me turn off my phone here uh, yes uh, so it's simply uh, forbidden uh, and uh, I as part of the activity we had uh, uh, took it was in 2019, I believe, uh, where well, we uh, collected this list of uh, zoning distances required in different locations. And you see that some go up to 2,000 meters, while others have no uh, zoning uh, requirements. Uh, and when you look at those, you see that the average of recommended distance is 200 meters, while the actual distance is uh, roughly 55 meters. Uh, and taking the decision uh, relating to noise, flicker, and all these real concerns into a summarizing decision of simply zoning without any uh, detailed explanations, without the ability to uh, provide for uh, solutions for the real problems, uh, results practically in a very difficult situation, which I personally have experienced uh, many sessions in the Israeli parliament where you have uh, developers attending as well as uh, citizens. The developers having uh, the requirement for, let's say, at least 1,000 meters of distance are frustrated because they know it, in many cases, is simply not justified. Uh, to require such uh, large distance from uh, dwellings, uh, while at the same time, the citizens in the same session are certain that the, that, uh, that the government is actually promising, uh, compromising on their behalf, on their safety and on their health for the benefit of the developers who have the money, who may be bribe the uh, decision makers uh, to set the distance, uh, the zoning distance, uh, to a distance which uh, will uh, compromise uh, their uh, self and their families' lives, safety and health. Um, so, uh, so there is constant resistance in this instability uh, within the, and, and frustration in all uh, related to all parties uh, for this very simple uh, decision taken uh, at a prior stage let me go uh, go further uh, to another example which again i'm facing here and i assume that this is also true in other locations uh, so, if we look at the requirement for uh, Flickr, uh, I assume all of you know what Flickr means. Uh, wind turbine rotates, the sun, uh, the sun is shining, and you have sh uh, shade and light uh, uh, alternatively. So, we have basically the German regulation, which was kind of adopted worldwide. Uh, with small minor variations stating that there should be no more than 30 hours per year and no more than 30 minutes per day uh, in the worst case. Worst case means that uh, you assume that the sun is only, always shining, there are no clouds in the sky, the, the turbine is always uh, positioned uh, for maximum flicker and so on. And if you exceed that uh, specific amount of uh, hours per year or minutes per day, uh, then you have to assure that you do not exceed eight hours per year in a real case. Uh, now, to, to clarify, if you, uh, at least here, when you, when you have to go uh, for the real case, then you have to introduce technologies that assure that there is no flicker beyond that amount. Uh, at least here. 
uh, which uh, also obviously uh, translates to uh, extra expenses, uh, curtailment, and so on. Uh, now, this German uh, uh, framework was adopted and is uh, perhaps relevant to Germany. Uh, however, uh, different considerations in different locations, uh, given different topologies, different technologies, may uh, modify the... Uh, by the way, the frequency as well, part of the consideration here is uh, uh, the effect of high frequency uh, shadow flicker effect. While, as we know, wind turbines are getting bigger and bigger, and the rotation speed is getting lower and lower, so that actually the, uh, the flicker rate is uh, reducing, and the health effects are also reduced. So, different considerations which were not taken uh, into account when setting up this uh, framework in Germany, followed by adoption uh, in practically, I would say, globally, uh, are uh, missing the point and for uh, for example what we see here is that uh, while the developers are obviously frustrated for uh, the unjustified curtailment requirements and the additional infrastructure costs the citizens uh, again are uh, uh, afraid that the government is compromising on the safety and health uh, for the benefit and the, of, of the developers and they start uh, proposing new agenda, new flicker uh, mechanisms, uh, claiming that, uh, for example, if in the topography they are living high up on the hill, then the sun is not to be limited to three degrees above the horizon as is uh, scheduled as, as the norm, but rather as starting at zero degrees, uh, the, uh, the, uh, so many uh, different localized uh, effects. Uh, if we would have had a global uh, kind of regulatory framework for this topic as well, could really assist both the developers on one hand and the citizens uh, understanding that the regulatory uh, framework does address the local uh, considerations related to the uh, specific uh, requirement. <coughs> Let me move on. Uh, if we talk about uh, the noise zoning uh, and the different codes available, uh, again, uh, the, the sound targets set in, set in DB uh, by different countries uh, present different uh, distances which are translated from the uh, from the codes and we can see here some examples of uh, the code in the Netherlands, Norway, Norway Sweden, uh, Finland, Germany, uh, Denmark, UK, which can range from roughly 600 meters uh, requirement uh, and going up to nearly two kilometers of distance uh, for the same sound level of 40 dB according to the different localized uh, codes. Um, then there is a lot of fuzz about uh, subsonic noise, and I did myself a thorough investigation into this. Uh, the reality is uh, that we, and if you look here at some of the, uh, I'm not sure if you see my cursor, do you? Stefan? In any case, at you the bottom left. No, I don't, uh, we don't see your cursor. Okay, okay, so, uh, subsonic noise is the is sound which goes below the limit of uh, human hearing, uh, below 20 hertz, which uh, may be felt uh, as vibrations in the, in the human body. Um, it is a noise which is created by thunders, waterfalls, ocean waves, avalanches, uh, wind, 
uh, volcanic activity, earthquakes, uh, the sound of whales uh, produces uh, subsonic noise, uh, infrasound, uh, and so do wind turbines. But as you can see on the right here in yellow, uh, this represents uh, on, the, on the x axis you see the frequency, and on the uh, on the y axis you see the sound pressure in dB. And you can see that uh, the range of up to 10 hertz or 20 hertz, which is uh, uh, represented here, uh, you can see that the threshold of hearing is uh, uh, going lower uh, as we, as you decrease the uh, uh, the frequency and the, th the threshold of pain is very very high especially when looking at multiple wind turbines which have been tested for their uh, uh, sound pressure levels uh, within this uh, uh, range of uh, frequencies relevant to subsonic noise uh, the thing is that regardless of the fact that the noise level is below uh, the ability of humans to uh, to feel at, uh, at given distances, I think that the research also uh, presents the fact that as long as you go beyond 50 meters from the wind turbine, this is impossible to, uh, to, to feel. Uh, People do not go into the details of the technicalities. And at the end of the day, you hear a rumor and you are stuck with the fact that these wind turbines do horrible things. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm lecturing to people from different uh, countries, developing countries, and I hear people asking me questions like, would a goat raise two heads if it's living next to a wind turbine? All kind of rumors. It's simply unbelievable. Um, so uh, now I gave some examples, and at the end of the day, the amount of things which a developer needs to uh, handle and take care of is really enormous. We have to make sure that there's good wind data in the location. Uh, we have to go through the land leasing agreements. By the way, as a, a brief introduction, the dual use uh, ability of wind uh, wind turbines is something of uh, really real value. Uh, we are currently running uh, into uh, bids of uh, dual use of land for ag agriculture and photovoltaics. Uh, so obviously, wind turbines have a great advantage over here. Uh, the grid connectivity survey, uh, grid capacity, uh, uh, going through public and experts hearings, uh, multiple topics under the uh, environmental and social impact assessments, uh, the wildlife, habitats, flora and fauna, uh, bird and bats fatalities, we've been through a uh, test lately of a technology uh, while measuring uh, a really tedious process in which the wind farm owners have to pay for the uh, uh, people who should uh, survey the location uh, twice a week, uh, looking for birds uh, uh, and um, uh, other topics, natural heritage, geology, hydro hydrology, uh, dust during uh, building, construction, architectural heritage, noise, which we mentioned, uh, safety and health, ISRO, uh, safety zoning uh, during construction phase as well. All the issues of trans, uh, transferring the, the, the blades and all the turbines to the site, uh, the proximity to roads, the increase of traffic, uh, proximity to power lines and distances, zoning distances from power lines. You have to be close to them and yet you have to keep uh, away from them. Um, uh, communication system interferes, air traffic uh, safety, radar interference, which is a huge issue here in Israel, uh, 
not sure how much it is in other locations, but bypassing technologies have to be introduced in order to, in order to get the permit, so that you have to make sure that you allow the uh, aviation radars to continue operating uh, after the construction of the wind farms. Shadow frequency, which we mentioned, light pollution is also very popular, you know, the small lights on the wind turbines, uh, very controversial and funny indeed. I mean, uh, you see all the dwellings with the lights and those few uh, lights on top of the turbines are a big disturbance to the population for some reason. Uh, so we have the, the light pollution. Uh, we obviously have all the excluded areas, natural reserves and so on. Uh, country demands monitoring program after the, making sure that all the uh, limitations are kept as required. And obviously there is the visual impact while at the bottom line, the reality is that uh, the part is that the, those who can get nothing out of the uh, wind farm are very much against it. Um, uh, by the way, and I also added here, uh, back and forth due to time-limited permits. So you get a permit for the grid connection, but then you do not get the permit for the uh, wildlife preservation. And you lose the grid connection permit and you have to run through uh, repeating processes uh, for differ different permits. Uh, so at least for Israel, uh, I see that other countries are not doing as uh, also as would have been required if we really need to uh, phase out of uh, fossil fuels. So uh, Stefan will go into the details of this uh, research late, uh, which was lately uh, performed. Israel got the uh, Honorable uh, world record for the duration of planning and permitting of uh, roughly 20 years. Practically speaking, Stefan, it's more than that because I know that the developers of the, some of the wind farms were acting so many years before trying to get into the process, but that's another story. So, uh, this is the practicality. Uh, while at the same time, we just heard the Prime Minister here, uh, Prime Minister Bennett, stating in Glasgow that uh, the goal is to cut emissions to net zero by two, uh, 2050 and phasing out of uh, the use of coal by 2025. So the question is really, how is it going to be achieved? Um, so uh, the, the answer, at least here, and I assume that this is uh, becoming true also in other locations as well, at least uh, in locations where there is a significant uh, solar radiation. Uh, the simple solution is, okay, let's have solar and storage. Now, people do not understand that, obviously, by stating storage, there is an impact to that, not only for the cost for shifting the energy from one uh, time frame to another time frame, uh, but also environmental impacts and financial impacts. And I did some uh, analysis uh, for Israel. And I, again, I assume this is practical for other locations as well. So what I did was taking uh, uh, different sources in different... If you, if you can try to come to the... Okay, two minutes. Yes. Please. So briefly here. So I was taking uh, different uh, sources uh, in different geographies in Israel of solar radiation, uh, then integrated different locations in geographies for wind, and then integrated the wind and the solar. And you see here in green is the amount of uh, constant, I, I normalized it to the, assuming a constant uh, consumption. So obviously you see a much larger amount of constant uh, the energy availability compared to the uh, availability of solar radiation, which is here in yellow. And when I integrated it over a year, uh, what you see here is the blue is the part which is kept by both solar and wind uh, to a normalized energy consumption, while assuming, uh, uh, and the only this small, tiny, uh, white missing parts 
are the amount of storage that would have been required, assuming we have provided uh, uh, a mix of uh, renewables only, solar and wind. We don't have much hydro uh, here in Israel. Uh, compared to the blue part, which is uh, the requirement for storage of energy if we only use uh, solar radiation as a source of energy. Uh, and practically speaking, unfortunately, nowadays the preferred alternative here and in many other places is uh, lithium ion batteries. And we see here an example of a, a warehouse of storage of lithium ion batteries. Uh, resulting, we hear many stories in the news on the results of the use of this, uh, not the time against it, but would like to see it reduced. Uh, bottom line, it's all about politics. So if we do not manage to uh, handle the opposition uh, from the public, who influences the, the politicians who set up the regulations, uh, we do not stand a chance. That is my end result here. So what we're going to do, uh, so this is a, a really a call for action. Uh, I'm just briefly mentioned to Stefan, I, uh, there is a, a call uh, which is uh, with allocated budget to it, which uh, I would love to attend with uh, relevant partners, many of them I saw during the sessions here uh, on this uh, discussion, um, to set up a global regulatory fra framework, address this uh, lessons learned given the common practice and variance of the geographies. I mentioned this, and by the way, I was listening to the previous uh, uh, session with uh, the Honorable MP, Mr. Uh, Babu. Uh, who uh, also was addressing exactly the same topic. Start setting up a global regulations which would be allocated to the different uh, locations uh, along with uh, forums uh, um, with common uh, grounds for and location for uh, citizens, politicians, uh, ministries, uh, having data exchange to uh, work on this important topic in order to re-enable wind energy globally. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gadi. Um, thanks a lot for this comprehensive, not so optimistic uh, introduction into the topic. Um, I hope that we can hear all others who have a maybe rather uh, optimistic view. Now, two questions to WebCon, two requests to WebCon. Uh, we have uh, John Titchen here. Please make him a presenter and please give me the permission to share my screen because I'm going to present next. So if Webcon, you can do that, please. Thank you. Um, John Titchen also make him a uh, presenter, please. So, Gadi, yes, um, you have uh, given us an overview of what are the topics which are relevant for uh, permitting processes. Let me mention that we had yesterday a session on social acceptance and a lot of these uh, more social aspects that you uh, referred to were covered. And there is already an ongoing discussion of having maybe something like recommendations for best practice uh, community citizen engagement, which would certainly not help all of what you said, but uh, a lot of what you said. Um, I can just also uh, um, I'll tell you that your list of, in, in particular, for we, we are in Bonn, but the, that's the state of Northern Westphalia. You can amend your list because the state government recently introduced a 1,000 meter minimum distance for wind farms, which includes small wind turbines, so the small five kilowatt turbines. And at the same time, brown coal mines, these open mines, they can approach up to 180 meters to where houses are built, where people are living. And that these are 500 meter deep holes. So that's the difference at the moment. Um, in, I just mainly speak about Germany because there's a new government about to be created and the new government just published two days ago, the new targets, they want to have 80% renewable electricity in Germany by 2030, from now around 50%. So that means there must be acceleration and they want to reserve 2% of the land of Germany uh, to be reserved for wind turbines. That all means with the current uh, uh, practice, it will not work. 
Now, what I'm going to present you now is the um, the study that actually Gadi you already mentioned. Um, as World Wind Energy Association, we did recently a study on uh, to compare the duration of planning and permitting processes in various parts of the world. So um, we were requested by some of our member companies who said that they would like to see this because some feel that their countries are particularly bad. Uh, some of them were a bit disappointed because others are even worse. So what we did is uh, we, we made a survey. Let me come to that. But I want first to present a problem here. What you see here is the, the development of wind energy. It's an amazing success story. We started 40 years ago with the modern wind turbines that we have today. Of course, we started centuries ago to harvest wind energy. But we started with 8 megawatt. I think that was mainly in the United States. And we are now 100,000 times the installed capacity of that time. And last year was an, a new record, mainly thanks to China. Uh, we have some countries which really have achieved a lot. China actually just yesterday, I was informed that China installed last year not 52,000, but 54,000 megawatt, um, which of course stands for the, a, a lot of the new capacity. But many countries have very ambitious targets. We know that our virtual host, India here, has very ambitious targets, but all these countries need to accelerate the deployment of wind energy. And many of them have quite, if I may say, uh, tight, uh, also uh, climate targets. We see that the long-term role of wind energy could be 40 to 50% of the global power supply. That means that we need to have a tenfold increase in installed wind capacity. So it would be around 8 million megawatt of installed wind turbines around the world. How do we come to that? One really big bottleneck is the planning processes of wind farms. We uh, sent out a survey to our member associations mainly, also some companies responded, and we came to a global average duration of the whole planning process. So we asked, when you start, you hire staff. No? You start planning a pro program until a project until it feeds into the grid. The global average here, and that includes the best, which have done a lot, is more than five years, 62 months. And just for the permitting process, that means when you go to the authorities, and submit your first kind of application documents, it still takes more than two and a half, two years, two and a half years. This alone, of course, as we see, when we think about the targets for 2030, is already too long. But when we look at some specific countries, of course, it gets even worse. You see here the average um, and the kind of uh, variability in some of the countries. So they see the average in uh, Ukraine, Argentina, India. India is doing quite well here, China, but the, the kind of shortest duration is the planning process. Ukraine, Argentina, China, they do uh, quite well. In the United States are also in an acceptable frame. And of course, Israel, as we've seen, in average more than 10 years, but some projects take 20 years. You look at the special case, of course, it's Germany, where there is a, it's possible to do it in a very short period of time but also may also take more than 10 years. So we also ask for the permitting time, the duration of the permitting process. Again, you have the same countries or similar countries which are doing quite well, Argentina, Ukraine, China, in this case also China, uh, Pakistan is quite okay. Germany with a similar situation, it can take, it is really difficult to imagine, but seven years to get a building permit, but some do it in even less than a year. And again, uh, Italy, which we hear from later as well, and Israel are the, at the longest, uh, have the longest duration of the planning processes. You find all this information on our website. We have uh, published a study. Here are the planning periods in time. But we thought that it doesn't make sense just to publish those months, but we also calculated into an index, which takes into account the relation planning process, permitting process, but also if there is a, a broad variety between the minimum and the maximum, because that is what investors don't like. It's better maybe, you know, it can be done in five years, then it could be in two or in 10 years. That's why we calculated this. So this is not, let me underline, this is not indicating um, the, the general quality of, of 
the policies which are in place. And it's not in months, but it gives you an idea of, of how the countries are ranked in relation to each other. What we find here is in terms of duration and reliability of planning, permitting processes, Ukraine and Argentina have the best scores. India, as you see here, is ranked six, with also quite acceptable score. And then you have uh, the, the kind of countries which do not really do well. Uh, let's say starting with 50, Turkey, Netherlands, Australia, Germany, Japan, Sweden, Italy, and Israel, again, is a country. It's of course, it's a small market, uh, but it shows us that really in some places, this is a real problem. So we have come up with uh, recommendations and certainly I think uh, it's, a, it's a worthwhile uh, proposal, Gadi, what you said, that let's see what we can do in general to uh, put together recommendations for how planning processes should be done. But our recommendation is that the permitting process should not take longer than 12 months. We don't believe that this period should be too short because this is a discussion again now in Germany that with the new government, they say six months and then it must be a yes or no. And we're afraid if you, if you say six months, then uh, in many cases, the decision will be no. And then uh, the, the extension of wind turbines will just be blocked. That's certainly not what we want. The greater standardization of approval procedures will help to shorten the duration. An important part, again, it was mentioned uh, by Gadi, by you. We had the session yesterday on uh, uh, social engagement, engagement of communities and citizens who live close by a wind farm. So it is important also in light of having local resistance and making uh, permitting processes more complicated to maximize the local share of economic and social benefits in order to make sure that the people, the locals are in majority supporting the project, which certainly will help when the mayor is on your side, when the town councillors are on your side, uh, maybe less, less uh, resistance will lead to less bureaucratic requirements and uh, um, back and forth discussion. And what we also suggest that is more for the policymakers, of course, that every country should look at this and understand there is a problem or a potential problem. And please check it, set up a monitoring process and see how these things are done in your country. So this is my kind of overview of uh, where we are. Um, I am now stopping to share my presentation. Yes, uh, this uh, it's it's a study which can be or it's a it's a publication. You can download the PDF from our website. Yes. So uh, thanks for your attention. Then I have the pleasure to introduce our next speaker from Australia. It's my pleasure that we have John Titchen here. John, a uh, nice evening. Have a good a good evening to you to Australia. I think it's. Close to nine o'clock your time. Thank you for joining us at this time of your day. And John, you are with Goldwind uh, Australia. So Goldwind Australia, it's a Chinese company, which is uh, has, a, uh, I think, a um, very big market share on the Australian market. Um, yes. And uh, you've been involved in the wind sector since many, many years, also working with other companies. And it's my pleasure that you will tell us now about what Goldwind is doing to address the uh, specific uh, challenge of bird mortality. So you've developed the technology which you will share with us uh, regarding or related to the environmental aspects. John, the floor is yours. Th thank you, Stefan. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people um, on, on, on this uh, call. Um, my name is John Titchen, as Stefan has introduced me. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Goldwind Australia. I'll just share a presentation screen. Uh, I'll just do that now. Uh, hopefully that comes across. Is that working okay, Stefan? Looks good, yes. Yeah, very good. So what I'll be talking about today is uh, this first Australian um, installation of a visual eagle detection system. Uh, that we've installed and is operating in uh, Tasmania in Australia. I'm talking to you from uh, Hobart in Tasmania, the southern state of Australia. Um, and uh, there's very interesting, a 200% uh, 
renewable energy target in Tasmania. I haven't heard of a target of this size before, uh, and the logic of this is that there's a cable uh, to the mainland of Australia uh, so that future increases in renewable energy can be exported. Um, and uh, at the moment, we're 100% uh, hydro and wind power. A little bit of a background on Goldwind and Goldwind Australia. So Goldwind's been in operation for about 23 years um, and has 73 gigawatts of uh, wind installed, or over 40,000 turbines, about 8,000 employees. And um, as Stefan explained, we're uh, Chinese owned, listed in Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Uh, in 2020, we we're the second largest installer of uh, turbines in the year. In Australia, uh, we've been in operation for over 11 years. Um, we've got a couple of hundred um, employees and have installed one and a half gigawatts of uh, wind power and, and a small amount of solar. Uh, we've got more than, third, more than a thousand megawatts um, of projects in our immediate plans and have um, turbines installed across different states of of, of, of Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, Western Australia and Tasmania. Um, we do focus on strong relationships with regional communities, contractors, grid companies, governments, etc. Um, there, there have been some restrictions on construction activities um, during COVID, but we found that um, that was not a restriction that faced us um, in Australia, the, the, these activities were permitted to con continue. So the project I'll be talking about um, is in Tasmania, the island state uh, at the bottom of Australia, and uh, the project is Cattle Hill Wind Farm. Uh, there is a sensitivity um, of rare eagles, uh, wedge-tailed eagles and white-bellied sea eagles in, in Tasmania. And so there's some regulations to protect those species. The journey that Goldwind's had in Australia, though, started with a small project in 2012 with one and a half megawatt turbines. And we've progressed to uh, further one and a half megawatt turbine installations, two and a half megawatt turbines, recently three and 3.57 megawatt turbines at a number of sites. Um, we have just installed our first 4.5 megawatt uh, machines in Western Australia and our future plans include a, a quite large site with, with 4.5 megawatt turbines and then 6 megawatt turbines in 2023. You can see that across Australia we've got quite a representation across the geography of Australia. The planning impacts are quite different in these states. If I look in Queensland, in, in the north of Australia, we've experienced quite quick planning approvals. In Western Australia, in the west, similarly quite uh, expeditious planning approvals. In the more densely populated areas of Victoria and New South Wales, much slower. In Tasmania, it's been quite slow also, but less for population reasons, more for native species. And so the technology I'll be talking to you about today is really to address those concerns that exist in Tasmania. In addition to this um, Eagle technology, we've had a focus on some hybrid developments, installing solar at wind farms. So bringing that connection together that we we're hearing about earlier of bringing the, the, the solar and the wind together to provide a more stable output. So we've done that at a couple of projects. We've also supplied turbines to some remote areas where um, a gold mine that's not connected to a main grid where there's wind, solar, battery, gas. Um, so a couple of projects like that. And one of our large next projects, Clark Creek Wind Farm, will have over a thousand megawatts of wind, 400 megawatts of solar potential and large batteries. So the integration of these technologies is also a focus that we're bringing. 
And we find that you know, if you can get the approvals for the wind, it's quite straightforward to also add in uh, solar batteries, these other technologies. So I'll move on to the main topic, um, Cattle Hill Wind Farm. This is an image of Cattle Hill Wind Farm in the centre of Tasmania. Uh, there are now installed 48 three megawatt turbines, so totaling 144 megawatts. This is enough to power about 5% of Tasmania, or 63 and a half thousand Tasmanian homes. The two species of uh, sensitivity are the Tasmanian wedge-tailed sea eagle and the white-bellied sea eagle. And the studies predicted that there'd be five eagles killed in the first year, and then up to lifting up to eight in the second year. Overall, nearly 60, to, 60 eagles predicted to be killed during, um, during the life of the project. And this project is aimed to avoid collisions and impacts on the populations. Because of the small population, these forecast uh, impacts uh, were of a concern. So the technology that we've implemented um, is called the IdentiFlight technology. And this was developed by a company, Boulder Imaging, from Colorado in the US. The technology combines artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, very high precision optics to detect and curtail um, turbines to reduce the risk of, of eagle collisions. You can see the, the tower on the right in the top of this slide. It has eight cameras, each pointing in the different sectors of the compass. And then on the top, there's a stereoscopic camera, and that is robotic, and it, it will actually rotate towards, to face um, an eagle that's spotted, measure its speed, um, measure the direction it's heading, so that the vector of the, of, of the um, of, of the bird can be um, determined and, and the risk assessed. Um, these are photos down the bottom here of a wedge-tailed eagle and a white-bellied sea eagle. 200,000 images were captured and categorized of birds from this system and then a neural network was trained to determine whether it was one of these species of birds. Before the, before the training was complete, uh, the system would pick up the number plate on a car as a potential target. Once it was trained, it, it, it's very accurate and, and can detect um, whether it's a wedge-tailed eagle or a white-bellied sea eagle. So we activated this system before the commissioning of the first turbine, and it's now undergoing a, an 18-month trial period. And this trial period is a condition of the approval. Um, and, and the inclusion of this technology uh, enabled the planning approval to be complete. Um, many stakeholders have been involved in the system, uh, in the implementation, and, and feedback has been uh, helpful in uh, tuning up the design and also making sure that it's effective. Um, it's the only technology that we're aware of uh, that classifies the species without human input. The beauty of this system is it's operating all day. As soon as it's light, it can operate. Um, it doesn't operate at night time because the visual sensors don't work, but these birds aren't flying at night. Um, it would be impossible to have people doing this task. So this is a map of the, of the site and the green dots are the 48 turbines. Uh, the Yellow squares are the identiflight stations. So those towers, like in the bottom left there, there are 16 of those um, across the site. And these locations are designed to provide coverage, uh, visual coverage of the, um, of the whole set of turbines. You can see in this image, this is a, a snapshot from the operating screen where the system is identified two wedge-tailed eagles um, from, from some of these towers. And you can watch this system and see the birds moving across the site and see turbines that are curtailed. 
So in fact, this is um, wedge-tailed eagle and this is curtailed turbine. So how the system works is these tower mounted optical units detect the eagles and, and track them. If the eagle speed and trajectory suggests a risk um, of a collision, a real risk, not a you know slight, uh, not a um, a, a miss, um, then a signal sent to the SCADA to shut down the turbine before the eagle arrives. And once the eagle is outside that um, risk area, uh, then a signal is sent to start up the turbine again. And so we have a cylinder effectively. Um, with a height and a diameter and if the bird is within that cylinder and heading towards the turbine then the turbine is shut down. So when we initially started the um, operation of this system um, we'd have uh, a, a turbine operating there would be a signal um, sent at a particular time then the turbine power would reduce, the rotor speed would reduce and then after a period um, the, the bird was clear of the area and then the turbine rotor would increase in speed and, and, and the power would then recover. And this took about 2.3 minutes of, um, of shutdown and uh, this was three months into the commissioning. We, we also had a fairly slow signal between um, the identiflight um, triggering a risk and the turbine rotor slowing. But you can see on the right here that this is these columns are the duration of the shutdowns. We've made some setting changes um, in February this year and, and we're able to almost halve um, the duration of shutdowns. So around about 1.4 minutes. So some of the key statistics from the system, it's been operating for over 700 days. Um, we've had a very large number of shutdowns, so uh, 340,000 shutdown events, um, quite a number during commissioning and, and then during operation. We were keen to put this system in before the turbines started operating so that we didn't start with impacts on the, on the birds, so that we had the protection from the beginning. So on average we have 400 shutdowns in a, in a, in a day. Um, a duration across um, these 48 turbines of um, over 12 hours, less than 13 hours of turbine shutdown. So that's equivalent of one turbine shutdown for half the day. And the duration of a shutdown is, is, is about, about two minutes. So we've um, had about 12,700 tracks per month of eagles. And the total amount of flight time that's been monitored is 1,420. We've collected an unbelievable number of images, 5.5 million images, and uh, that's you know, about a quarter of a million images per month now. So this system has been well recognised. Um, it's been um, given an innovation award by the Clean Energy Council in Australia this year. Um, a lot of support from landowners, eagle experts, the federal and state government environment bodies um, have reviewed it carefully, um, visited site, um, and it has some potential to um, reduce the restrictions on wind development in Tasmania in particular, where these species are of concern and enable further development of wind. We, we had a target at the beginning of the project to achieve a limit of 1% loss of energy from the system. And you know, when you see those numbers, you, you think, oh, how much loss is caused by this? And we're very, very close already after just um, uh, less, than, less than two years of operation, um, very, very close to that. We're slightly below the 1%, about 0.9% um, percent shutdown. And so that was factored into the investment decision. Uh, it was planned at the beginning and, and these authorities that are now looking at this can see this as a real solution to mitigate the impacts. Um, it continues to attract attention um, and we hope that uh, it will be a good um, 
example, uh, there might well be other technologies that can be deployed. We hear of different solutions and we encourage the um, adoption of them uh, in order to enable development. Without this technology, um, we face some real challenges with getting this project into construction. So um, if there's any interest in uh, uh, further details on this, we'd be happy to be contacted. And uh, certainly also uh, we can provide direct contact to the Identity Block team uh, under Boulder Imaging. Uh, this is an image of the site in the winter. You might think of Australia as, as hot and sunny. Um, sometimes uh, in some of the locations in Australia, it, it does get pretty cold. And uh, just this month, we've had snow up at the site in, uh, in Cattle Hill. So uh, thank you everyone uh, for the opportunity to share this uh, uh, information and um, hope, uh, have a good rest of the, of the sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a, a very inspiring, I would say, a, a very um, good presentation. So I understand you're right that the technology you're using for this is, uh, is not a radar, but it's, it's a camera, right? It's a, it's a visual detection. Yes. Yes, the, 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 the cameras um, are, are very high quality cameras and, and it does re rely on light and, and being able to see. So if there were obstructions, um, then, then it would not be able to detect the, the birds. And uh, it's, it's similar, I think, to some of the technology we're now seeing in cars with you know, um, cars being able to recognise a road sign. Um, these technologies are spreading across different industries, and it's great to see the application in this in this sector. So, have you have you are you planning to or yeah, probably this was not only made for one project, but are there already any concrete plans to apply this also and maybe also share with other other um, maybe with your competitors in the market? Yeah. So th this technology is not proprietary to Goldwind. Uh, it is Identiflight is the, the brand and, and it is available to all participants in the market. Um, we're, we're keen to share this, the, the learnings, uh, the experiences and, and see it as a, um, a, a possible solution where there are rare birds that need protecting. You know, if, if in other states, we also have wedge-tailed eagles, but it's not a rare species. And, and so it's not necessary to implement this technology, but where, where there is a constraint, um, such as in the US with uh, bald eagles and golden eagles, that's where the technology was developed. Uh, we've just applied it for the first time in Australia and uh, top of the world wind farm in Wyoming was the first example of where it was applied. Um, and uh, Res were the developer there and there were some constraints on the operation of the project and some heavy fees if a, if it finds if, if if a bird was struck and, and so there's quite a strong commercial incentive for its development um, and then we've benefited from being able to apply it in Australia uh, to enable Cattle Hill Wind Farm to be uh, be progressed so we're very pleased with the collaboration and um, uh, very pleased with the reaction in the local community uh, and the regulators. Uh, so th these challenges that you see with projects, my, in my experience, it's best if if you can meet them at the beginning before you construct, uh, then it's a much more satisfying, engaging um, process for, for building for building these projects, uh, knowing that you've got everything in order. Um, I, I saw the list of challenges earlier for for wind development and you know, many of them ring true. And, and this is the difficult task that we have to, uh, to, to deal with all these requirements. Um, and uh, I think I saw on the list uh, the distances uh, that are regulated in some locations. And in Australia, we do have larger distances regulated, but we also look at agreements with neighbours in order to share the benefits with neighbours so that they come on, on board. Um, certainly noise restrictions, uh, you know, quite quite tight, and uh, lots of evidence needs to be provided. So, it's it's challenging work, but um, you know, it's quite satisfying when uh, these uh, challenges can be met. Just yes, thank you very much, and in particular, sharing with us how the the one specific uh, challenge could be solved in a in a very 
constructive way. And I think we're all happy when we see that these eagles stay alive and they, they are well protected and we can still harvest the wind energy. Now, uh, thanks a lot again. And maybe you can, uh, we see whether there will be any questions from the audience. Actually, I would like to ask Webcon to let me know because in one of my previous sessions, I was told later that there was a question which I obviously didn't notice. So if there are questions from the audience, which we do not see here, who is there, um, then please share them uh, with me and, and make us aware of it. Now, it's my pleasure to invite our next speaker. We're kind of coming back to India, to our virtual host country, and uh, great pleasure um, to uh, welcome Ashish Swarup from the company at Spring. Uh, which is also has experience with uh, developing wind farms in India. And you will tell us about the situation in India. How is the situation and what are the challenges of wind power permitting processes in India? Ashish, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thanks, Stefan. So situation in India is, uh, I would say, after listening to my friend, Mr. Gadi, pretty decent, pretty good, but, and we end up completing projects in about three years. The moment we are awarded a project, we commission the project in three years or less than three years. And typical project size in India is now 300 megawatt. So let us say about 100 turbines commissioned within three years, including on land, permitting, grid connections, civil aviation, defense, birds and bats, social issues, public issues, et cetera, et cetera. I think challenges are same everywhere. So before getting into those details, I will uh, talk a little bit about what we have done at Spring, what is happening in India, and uh, what, I have, uh, what I have done in uh, wind energy in last 15 years. So my employer is Spring Energy, which is a private equity setup uh, platform in India by Actis. Actis is an emerging market investor and among the largest uh, energy investor in uh, emerging markets. So in spring, we have about 2000 megawatt of uh, projects. And out of that, we have two largest projects, which are wind project. One is set up in uh, Western India with Chinese machines and vision wind turbines. Second one is uh, we have set up in Tamil Nadu, that southern part of the India, with three meter, three megawatt turbine and 140 meter rotor and 120 meter hub height. And as of today, that's the largest turbine we have in India. And <clears throat> on the national public policy or political scene, I think our prime minister is uh, very, very aggressive on renewable energy. He has set up the targets, which most of us, you know, were even scared to think about. And after a few years now, we believe that we can certainly achieve those targets. So we have very inspirational leadership in our country. And uh, many of you must have seen him speaking at COP26. And it's not only that he's setting up big targets. Managing a complex country and a complex industry like uh, wind, complex country like India and a complex industry like wind is not easy at all. So one great thing which he, and, and one more factor which uh, differentiates India, India is fundamentally a solar country. We get about 320 days of uh, solar radiation in India. There are hardly any places where we have a snow and all those. So we have solar radiation everywhere in India. And uh, wind is uh, limited to our western part of India. That's towards uh, Indian Ocean and Pacific side. So in this, uh, this kind of uh, setting, the ambitious target itself is, you know, is a blessing for all of us who are in the industry. So and uh, government of India through its uh, regulators have done a study which is very important to achieve the optimum energy mix, optimum from grid stability perspective, from demand perspective, as well as from economics perspective. How do you give 
low cost energy to all Indians. So that's the theme of the report. And based on that report, we are about to see, uh, that report says that India will have to do 140,000 megawatts of energy. We are currently around 40,000 megawatts in 2021. So another 10 years, we are e easily looking at additional 100,000 megawatt as per that report. But it's not going to be easy to 10,000 megawatt every year. Our best year has been 5,000 megawatt. That, that was in 2016-17. On the potential side in India, we can set up about 700,000 megawatt of wind. Uh, wind projects based on water and 2.5 mega, megawatt turbine. So potential wise, we have it. Government intent, political intent, public mood, extremely in favor of wind and solar both. Emerging market. In, uh, uh, I think there is something wrong with internet. Is it okay now? So what yeah, I, I have done I have wind, some interruptions when you speak, but I'm not sure whether it's on my side here. Others have the same. So I have been involved in setting up very large wind farms. So one of the sites which we developed was 600 megawatt. You know when market was very small. And now coming to, you know, before understanding uh, challenges in permitting and approvals, I think it's extremely important to understand the structure of power industry in India. We have a central transmission utility, central grid, that's a national grid. Then we have provincial grids, uh, usually called state transmission utilities. And we have 30 plus states and about 35 plus state transmission utilities. And all these are connected to our national grid or the central central transmission utility. And we get PPA means our PPA pipeline is great. Means uh, central government and as well as uh, state government they keep coming with auctions. And in a year you can have anything between fifteen to twenty thousand megawatt auctions in India. So in india we really you know we choose which option we should participate and which option we should not rather than many emerging markets and other markets where everybody waits for the same option now <clears throat> these grids uh, so for setting up a wind power project in india one has to you know at concept stage one has to worry about fundamentally four approvals first is civil aviation because we are a developing country and uh, number of airports are increasing and there are a lot of air strips in india which are not in use and uh, in the western part of india you have more air strips and in western part of india we have a lot of defense installation so first and foremost we have to worry about clearances from Ministry of Defense as well as uh, Ministry of Civil Aviation. So Ministry of Civil Aviation clearances are, you know, everything is online, but it takes its own time. It may take anything from 10, 15 days to about three months, depending on the system and everything. And there is a bit of secrecy in those uh, uh, permit processes, because as a common man, I will not know what is going on in civil aviation planning and but civil aviation department will make their own changes which may not come in public domain so that creates a bit of issue but not a single project has been delayed uh, has been you know rejected because of this next is uh, the crucial when you said uh, start thinking of a project the one of the crucial thing is ministry of defense approval and that approval also, you have to submit everything online and you have absolutely no access to meet any government official. So in a way, it is excellent because you don't, you can't influence anybody logically or illogically. 
So, and that saves you from a lot of corruption, which uh, people have seen in uh, Asian countries. But at the same time, this approval takes a lo long time. And <clears throat> the best way is you get a very qualified consultant, ask him to do the mapping. And then you are pretty sure that yes, this approval will come or your project or few turbines of the project are in trouble or not. And all this is done before you actually start spending money on the project. So your money is not at risk and you know beforehand what is going to happen to your project. Fortunately, Ministry of Renewable Energy has taken very, very aggressive steps. And now they represent all the project developers to Ministry of Defense. So that's the positive thing in India. And you know, what has happened in India in last few years, many government officials are also on WhatsApp along with the industry. So you raise a concern, at least they know what is the concern. Whether it will be resolved immediately or it will take some time or it will take a month, uh, that is still to be seen. But at least you can reach out very fast. So that's a positive thing. Moving on to, you know, once you have these uh, uh, studies and then you check the environmental things, like is there a sanctuary, bug sanctuary or wildlife sanctuary nearby your project? That data is available, consultants are available and most of the people in industry, they know the terrain. <clears throat> but these are the mistake, you know, these three approvals, civil aviation, Ministry of Defense and environmental approval. These are the three approvals. One has to, you know, make sure that they are project developers are very clear before spending money. Approval, actual approval may come a little late, but you can have very high confidence if you work with the right guys within your team, within your company, or with help of government officials, or with help of uh, qualified consultants. And you know. <clears throat> Uh, unlike many other countries in India, permit approval, land acquisition, and construction, everything moves together. So it's a very, very, you know, stressful process. But end result is we set up projects in 24 to 30 months. Unlike, you know, my friend was telling about 10 years or so. So our process is very stressful, but it's very fast. So that's what India is. Now, moving to the next level of approval, obviously the first thing is grid connection. So if you win an auction, uh, uh, let me put it this way, many auctions are centered around the grid connection. So the moment you enter an auction and you win that, you win your PPA in that, that auction, your grid connectivity is more or less guaranteed. So your risk is very low, but at the same time, <clears throat> uh, if you wait for the auction to happen and you don't do any development studies, you are going to delay the project. So most of us in industry, what we have started doing is we start development, we wait for the auction and parallelly government has also agreed to our request about, about a year ago year, year and a half ago. So if you have basic uh, financial capability and you have 50% of the land in your possession, grid will give you grid connection. So that reduces project risk uh, drastically. So you have two pathways, wait for the auction, win the auction, and you get a right to get grid connectivity. It's not a legal right but in all practical senses 99.9 percent .9 you will get that grid connectivity at that particular substation of the grid second pathway is choose the area have your financial muscle have your financial capability purchase land 50 percent of the required land and then uh, grid will allow you to connect your project subject to availability and most of the large players like Spring or other players, we are also working on this second thing, second uh, option of getting the grid connection. Now, <clears throat> moving to the next thing, 
say in india you have multiple departments like any other country you have uh, local authorities who monitor your construction then there are environmental agencies there are ngos there are local communities and within local communities you have different uh, people people with different level of land rights then you have uh, authorities at the state level who will approve your land acquisition so now moving from basic four approvals to the next level of approvals which can make or break your project these are fundamentally related to land so as you know india is a very very populated country 1.3 billion people and uh, our area is not as big as uh, uh, like top four largest geographical area uh, countries so land is always under pressure so our uh, guiding philosophy country's guiding philosophy on land is let's monitor or regulate land uses so if you want to set up any industrial activity or convert agricultural land to any other use like residential or industrial or commercial you have to go back to the land authorities in the state and take their permission so dif different states in india have different uh, policies different regulations but ideologically speaking you have to submit your plan you have to tell them which village which town which county you are buying land or you are proposing to buy land what is the quantum of land and what kind of land it is whether it is barren land or irrigated land you submit your proposals and it takes time you know preparing that proposal and submitting that proposal takes time but generally speaking in last many many years uh, i would say since 2008 or 9 i have not seen a single proposal being rejected so question is here you select it right and make your application correct and the environment political environment or public mood is in favor of uh, renewable energy so it's unlikely that your proposal will be rejected or will be rejected or in worst case scenario uh, your government or regulators will ask for some additional uh, measures to be taken now the moment you have this uh, land use change permissions whether before buying land few states will allow before buying land few states will allow you to uh, apply after you have purchased or you have acquired the rights uh, of those lands next level of issue which will come up is more of social issues like are you near to roads or pathways or near uh, a school or a village and fundamentally all those challenges they come from uh, uh, noise and shadow flicker in india we don't have a very clear law for windmills and noise there is a law uh, which regulates noise pollution but there are gray areas in those uh, in in those regulations at a state level as well as at central level but the best practice is you know uh, both our suppliers envision china as well as nordex uh, spain nordex acciona uh, both of them have been pretty helpful in you know measuring the noise and uh, mapping the entire behavior Uh, turbine behavior from noise perspective so we have uh, those documentation done law doesn't require us to do it but as a platform as a very responsible company we did it ourselves and at the same time if you don't do it and if it is your turbine is really creating a lot of noise for uh, villages around you you are bound to get into trouble so that's the <clears throat> most important thing today shadow flicker in india i have seen people i haven't uh, started creating any noise there is low awareness but again it's always better to be responsible and take uh, those measures proactively the key message is you know we can do projects fast there is a lot of uh, trouble uh, there are multiple process processes going on uh, parallelly and one 
government department will not acknowledge another government department. So those are, I think, standard problems, like what I've seen across Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Good thing is people in government, people in uh, public, all of them, and including press, they are very supportive. Having said that, you have to have very, very strong legal as well as regulatory team as and in addition to external lawyers means that atmosphere is positive doesn't mean that you take shortcuts and one has to be very proactively looking at issues like we haven't encountered this eagle issue in india so far but for uh, there is a state in uh, western india where we have an endangered species of a bird that's called great indian bustard so only 60 uh, birds are live now. So Indian Supreme Court has taken a very tough stand. And at the same time, government of India is uh, articulating it with the Supreme Court of India. Like we have to balance it out. And that state is best for solar. So our solar friends have a lot of issues in that state. But you know, there is a very high degree of consultative process which is going on in India between the state government, central government, industry, public, environmentalist, as well as uh, judiciary. So all of us are very confident that we will find out a way. And the way John uh, illustrated this technology use for uh, identifying eagle, I think this is something uh, very useful in uh, means if this if we have to set up a project in that state. I think technology is the answer to regulatory or public policy issues. So <clears throat> I would uh, like to end here and will be happy to you know, uh, answer any queries if there are. Yes. Thank you very much, Ashish. This was giving a very good overview of what the situation is in India. If I just may directly ask you a question, I'm just I'm not sure whether you, you've explained it and I, I missed that point. I think the, the, you, you referred to the permitting process uh, related to the auction. So w which kind of permitting, uh, which part of the permission process has to be completed before you submit your, your bid? Is it just really easy? Civil That's, aviation? Uh, no. Say you, as per law, you are not required to submit anything other than your financials before auction. Mm -hmm. But it's a better, uh, I would say, uh, better strategy to start your processes before auction. Because the moment you win auction, your counter starts. You have to complete projects uh, as per auctions within 18 months or 24 months. And nobody would like to pay penalty for delay. So legally speaking, we are not required to do it. That's, Technically speaking, it's always better. That's an interesting. That's an interesting information because some countries require the full permission when you submit the the uh, no uh, not documents anything. for the. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Then, um, do we have other questions here? I again don't see any. Um, then I would again say thank you very much for this uh, uh, important contribution and the overview of the situation in India which is obviously different from other countries. So it's always good to hear different perspectives here. And let's now go to Italy. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Davide Astiaso Garcia from the Italian Wind Energy Association. Um, I've recently visited Italy. It was a great pleasure. It was my first trip uh, since the pandemic started uh, in, in, uh, at an at a event where we met in person, unlike here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you here now again in this format, which is still great that we can meet at the same time people from around the world. Davide, now you are going to speak about the situation in Italy, which I assume is different from the Indian situation, also from the, the one in uh, uh, India and uh, uh, from uh, Israel and from Australia. Now the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Stefan, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting panel. And uh, yes, the situation is, uh, is quite different. Uh, it's uh, interesting to, to have different point of view with different uh, challenges uh, in, each, uh, in each country, in each context for, uh, for wind energy mainly. So uh, in Italy, we have some 
challenge um, objective from here to the next uh, nine year with the 2030 targets um, that are uh, the ones uh, um, highlighted by the, the, the Italian government with the National Energy and Climate Plan. So the, the I, yes, I speak from ANEV, the Italian Wind Energy Association, uh, where I'm the Secretary General. We include more or less hundreds of um, companies dealing with wind energy in all the, the business uh, typologies, and most of them are international ones. So uh, you will find some more information about us uh, if you are interested to the Italian market in uh, in our website. So in this uh, picture, you can see a very quick. Uh, situation of what happened in uh, uh, in uh, in the last uh, 20 years because now now we are uh, already uh, overcome some different phases uh, there was a first phase of uh, first installation in the first years of 2000s uh, until 2003 and then we we saw a constant growth of the wind energy sector from 2004 until 2012 and uh, after this uh, mainly for some regulatory uh, problems criticalities uh, related with the with the not so efficient systems of actions and also with other uh, italian rules that did not give to investors enough vision for uh, uh, attracting funds in our countries. Uh, we have seen a sector in pass from 2013 to, to 2020, to last year, this year. And, and as you can see, we in the National Energy and Climate Plan objectives that are the ones being pointed by the government, not by us, by the Italian Association, we have to, to to increase the, the 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 speed up of the installation in the last in the following uh, next uh, uh, nine years uh, so something has to change otherwise we will not get the the final targets so what are these targets uh, uh, specifically for the wind energy sector we see now that we installed more or less 10 gigawatt of uh, Italian uh, uh, of uh, wind uh, power plant and uh, this 10 gigawatt uh, produced the uh, main most mainly uh, an average of uh, 19 or 20 terawatt hours per year and uh, and we have 16000 units of employees uh, directly and directly involved in the wind energy sector uh, we have to more than double of our um, installed capacity, reaching at least 20 gigawatt, because now the objectives are still in, um, the objectives uh, are uh, still increasing for, with a fit for 55 targets. And uh, and we have to, to, to increase largely also the number of employees until six, 67 units. So there will be some much possibility for working in Italy in the wind energy sector, and mainly in the southern and central region of our countries. Uh, we have seen that there is, uh, the, 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 we have assessed the potentialities of the wind sources in Italy, and there is a room for doubling the power. The power. There is also an interesting room uh, for offshore wind technology, offshore wind plants, in uh, for um, uh, using the floating platforms uh, that is opening this sector to the Mediterranean Sea, not only in Italy. Uh, for example, giving some numbers, we have seen that in the last couple of years, the Italian TSO Terna received uh, more than 30,000 megawatt of request of grid connection from uh, around the 30 projects of offshore wind in Italy. So the potential, the potential is uh, is good enough. Uh, the problem is mainly related with the permitting. That is the uh, the is the the the, the focus of this uh, presentation. Uh, we have seen that the the permission, the authorization procedures, which cost uh, constantly decreased in the last uh, nine years, and. Uh, 
without this authorization of course we cannot install a new new power plants uh, we highlighted the uh, um, 676 decrease of uh, um, percent 76 percent of decrease of authorization procedures in the last years uh, so without this authorization we cannot go forward and uh, the main problem is related to a uh, too slow uh, procedures we these procedures usually takes uh, an average of five and a half years we have seen in the Stefan presentation that Italy is one of the more critical country relating with the permitting procedures with the times and the, the, the barriers we have most of these barriers are related to the environmental impact of the system with particular regard to the cost and denials of superintendencies uh, we are in strict contact with, uh, in close contact with them uh, we have seen uh, zero percent of authorization of over uh, nine thousand megawatt of requests submitted from in the last four years so it should not be possible because of course uh, we have to, to to preserve the landscape we have to preserve the cultural heritage we have to preserve the italian tourism of course but uh, we are more than uh, sure that uh, it can be done together with the energy transition and the energy transition in italy is mainly due to wind and pv these are the two technologies wind has to double pv has to um, to, to increase three times the installed capacity now. Uh, so there is also some inconsistency between regional plans and regulation with the national objectives. There are inconsistencies between the different kind of ministries, the, the Ministry of um, uh, the Transition and the Ministry of Cultural Heritage, that is the one that lead the superintendencies. And in many cases, many projects of our members will go to the prime minister officers if there are some inconsistencies between the two ministries. And at the end, we they got the authorization, they got the permission uh, at the prime minister officers. The problem is that it uh, needs a lot of years and the, the, this uh, time is not uh, compatible with the industrial investment of course so the sector is affected by these uh, uh, long procedures so we are working also with the energy transition ministry for the simplification of authorization procedures the new decree already um, published in italy uh, they go to the right that they went to the right direction they followed many of our suggestions but of course the the the, the, the way is still long and uh, we we need many other uh, simplification many other um, amendment to their national uh, regulation of uh, wind energy sector for achieving this target and speed up the installations uh, we need single technology auction until 2030 it's not mainly a matter of um, money because uh, we have seen a very significant decrease of the of the um, installation um, uh, costs with the lcoe and now the, the wind energy section is quite competitive also without um, many uh, additional funds for incentives it's more a matter of uh, a long-term vision and uh, and simplification procedures so that's more or less all the the state of the art here in uh, in italy so we also are working with for the promotion of ppa power purchase agreement that can be a a, a very interesting and very effective uh, tool uh, together with auctions uh, for uh, in fostering the wind energy sector in our country in uh, in the la in the next uh, years uh, so thank you again for inviting me and uh, if you have some question i'm uh, happy to to answer now or here you can find my contact for any kind of uh, clarification or um, suggestion in the next days Thank you again. Yes, thank you very much, Davide. I think your presentation is really kind of underlining the need and, and demonstrating that we have some places where we need to 
accelerate uh, in the way that we have discussed, we need to accelerate the permitting processes. Um, Italy certainly has great potential and has shown that uh, you can install uh, wind turbines on a large scale, but there needs to be, of course, more that must be faster. Yes, thank you uh, very much. Then uh, I would again see whether there are any questions here from uh, the audience, which again, I don't see here. Is WebCon any question has come up? Otherwise, of course, also amongst the, the panelists here, which we can see directly, um, if we have, uh, yeah, there is a question actually, a question for John. Yes. So otherwise I would already invite you also, if you have any question amongst the panelists here, to uh, your fellow panelists. John, are you still with us? There's a question for you I am. From, from the audience. Maybe you can read it here. Um, were there mor mortalities during the over 700 days of operation? Yes, so during the uh, commissioning process, we had two, two circumstances where we had, we had a mortality. Uh, one was where the system was um, overridden so the automatic system uh, was disabled um, you know, due to a wrong procedure um, and the other was where there were trees um, uh, obscuring uh, the vision and, and so those trees have now been removed in order to um, provide clear vision. So these two circumstances um, resulted in impact and uh, we've got mitigations to avoid that in future. So, you know, the regulators have looked at these um, carefully and uh, feel that it um, uh, you know, really does validate the system. If I may ask, because you just spoke about this, a specific type of eagles, is the system also recognizing other other birds and or can it recognize that this is a bird which is not uh, yes. on risk of flying into the turbine? Um, so it does recognize other birds and I've seen on the system, for example, a raven um, uh, and that those birds are not protected and so it doesn't take protecting action. And, and so if, if a raven were to fly at the turbine, then it would be allowed to fly uh, towards the turbine. So it, it distinguishes between these birds and it, it's quite amazing because wow. the birds are in all sorts of different um, states. You know, sometimes they're diving or, or they'll have their wings out or have their wings in uh, from a different angle. And so this is why such a lot of data is needed to, um, to train the neural network so that it can do that recognition. And so people have helped train the neural network, um, but then once it's trained, it, it can do the work you know, all day long. Very good. But that sounds very promising also when you have found the mistakes and they can be corrected. I think it's normal mistakes happen, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's important you can solve them. Um, yeah, we have any questions here amongst the, the panelists? If not, I would then um, kind of coming back to um, what you have said, Gadi, you have proposed a way that you think could help many countries, maybe some countries which are better in, in giving the approval process may not need that. But let me ask then first uh, Ashish. Um, Gadi has proposed that, and that is also a question that we as well, the Energy Association, of course, very much interested in, uh, whether there it would be a need or it would be useful to set up something like international recommendations, guidelines, anything that would guide national, local decision makers in proving the ways that uh, uh, approval processes are managed? Would that be something that you would see India would rather benefit for or would you be uh, help a uh, be helpful and help other countries? Which, how would you see this relation? Uh, I see it as a, 
give and take relationship i will certainly learn i means my country will certainly learn from experience of uh, north america or europe okay and uh, maybe our problems are maybe unique but it may not be uh, <clears throat> means we will certainly be able to learn and one thing which i like very much in gaddy's presentation he was talking about twint permit application so you know the biggest problem i face in india is i have to make probably 50 different applications for different different 50 different approvals so if there can be a guideline which we can uh, impose upon or uh, you know influence government okay these are the 50 things 1 2 3 4 5 and this is my proposal and these are my 200 500 600 pages you please go and talk to your ministries and your regulators and your bureaucrats i am more than happy to wait for 6 month and then you please come back and tell me okay your proposal has got these five or 10 shortcomings or you put a uh, fine or compound something i mean that will make life easy and this entire you know permitting process as you said in the beginning of this session permitting process is the fundamental reason for delay in wind projects so if we can <clears throat> technology our friends like john will take care financing construction development companies like mine will take care but our interface with public and government uh, there is nobody to take care each one of us takes care of our own issues so if we can uh, you know bring out uh, some common learnings and uh, educate our bureaucrats and government it way it is going to help it is going to uh, help each of each one of us maybe there are few things which we do better than other countries mm. okay. so more like a learning platform which yeah. could always upgrade the experience yeah, and then why i am able to do project in 3 years and why israel is not able to do in 10 years So, and what your your concrete kind of or what you would like to see for india would be rather better coordination on government side that there is a maybe one stop shop ideally and we we'll yeah. see how other countries would do that very good thank you then i would uh, request davide what do you think about such an idea would that be helpful i mean we have i know in europe we have some common uh, regulations anyway uh, but uh, still i think there's still a lot that is different within europe and then when you listen to our colleagues from australia and uh, india and it, uh, in israel what do you think about so oh, yes i think totally i totally agree with your vision and this idea that i think it can be very useful not only for italy but for any other countries uh, and, and not only at european level of course uh, we have we have to follow the eu directives so uh, we have some basic rules for each state member but uh, the differences also inside uh, the european uh, union are uh, in some cases very significantly thank you david that was also a clear uh, answer um john if i may ask you when you you talk mainly of course about the birds but your general view on this would that be something that could also help the australian uh, wind sector in general to develop to have some i, th I think so in, in australia we have several states and each state does planning differently and so we have not the same system across australia uh working in different different parts of australia we need to approach things differently and we see different performance uh, some very swift and some very slow um one of one of the uh, planning ministers uh, the planning minister for new south wales has said that he would like to see new south wales with the most the quickest most efficient planning system so has has stated this as an objective for renewable energy in new south wales and then i see your uh, comparison across different countries and i think benchmarking and and setting maybe a target as to what would be a good achievement um is something that then uh 
countries and states can strive for and compare themselves to and be ranked against. So I think scorecards and benchmarks um, are very, very helpful and uh, you know, less less complexity and difference would help help developers. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're a small population in Australia, but we've got several different systems in such a small uh, population. Uh, it seems quite inefficient. And uh, then we've got many players working across different countries and having to deal with different systems. Probably the most difficult thing that we've had last few years though has been grid connection. And uh, we're, we're really uh, at, at a most complex level in Australia on grid connection. And, and uh, we, we probably need to find some, some gains in that area as well. Thanks a lot, John. Um, similar answer like the previous speakers. Gadi, you have the last words and uh, I see that already speakers are in the room for the next session. So I'd like to uh, ask you for a, a, for your conclusion kind of after you are now heard the other speaking um, and of addressing also your idea uh, or your proposal, what is your conclusion? Yes, yeah, so, so thank you, Stefan. So certainly I would say that, for example, if you provide recommendations uh, for guidelines in locations where there's no uh, I don't know, zoning issues or whatever, uh, setting up a global regulation could could harm and reduce the the pace at which uh, wind farm uh, development uh, is performed. But uh, I, I see from uh, from everyone that uh, it seems like, uh, for example, what John just said, setting up a benchmark and benchmarking in different countries, different regions, so that there is really uh, a, a, a a common mechanism that would uh, allow us to uh, to to check ourselves and uh, move forward uh, to really achieve the target. So I'm very happy to hear that um, many many of us are in agreement on the need for setting up something which will have a common uh, basis uh, to continue the operation. Thank you. Very good. Then I thank you all. I think also those in the audience, which we are not seeing directly here. Thanks a lot. I wish you a, well, especially a good night, I think, to Australia. Have a good day. Uh, have a good rest of the conference, those of you who are joining other sessions. And with this, I close this session. And uh, yeah, then we hand over soon to the next session, which will soon start here. And let me mention that the next session, which will soon start uh, in, in this uh, call, is about large-scale hybrid systems, which will start in less than 10 minutes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.